year in. <laughs> Hey there, welcome to another episode of the String Things podcast. This is episode number 13 and everything about March. If you are a returning viewer, welcome back to my channel. And if you're tuning in for the first time, welcome and thank you for joining me for today's podcast. My name is Mel, I'm a stay-at-home mom in Vancouver, Canada, and this channel is where I share everything about my knitting hobby. I wanted to say thank you to everyone who has recently subscribed, and thank you as well to everyone who's been hitting like and leaving me such wonderful comments. I do read every single one, and I enjoy responding back to them as well. And I also wanted to say thank you for... Um, all the views and likes on my last video, a non-podcast type video about reviewing my knit wardrobe. When I was coming up with the idea for that and the criteria on how to conduct performance reviews on my knitwear, I really wasn't sure how it was going to be received and I was actually concerned that the content was going to be a bit dry and possibly boring. but seems like everyone likes that perspective and is enjoying it so definitely want to revisit that and make some more similar videos and do some more performance reviews in the future so let's get into what happened um, in the month of march so i have one finished object to share and if you've been following along then you know, by me saying I just have one means I didn't meet my goal of having three finished objects for the month of March. I admit it was, you know, a very ambitious goal and I'm not disappointed that I didn't get there. I think I, you know, was pushing myself and reaching too high um, with that kind of goal, especially with one of the items being a fingering weight item. But, um, I get to share them as whips for the podcast um, a little later on. So let's get into what's affectionately referred to as my brown sweater uh, because it is brown and it's also my only brown sweater in my wardrobe. So here it is. I am not wearing it. It is quite a warm day. Um, I would say it's an unusually warm spring day here in Vancouver. It's March 28th. And it's 17 degrees outside. Um, yeah, that's not typical uh, early spring weather for sure. I was out wearing my new brown sweater. Um, and I was actually too warm wearing this over top of this long sleeve. But yesterday when I was wearing it and, you know, last week, perfect spring weather. Because I think the temperatures were closer to, let's say, 12 degrees Celsius. Uh, but here it is. This is a mashup of two designs. The first one being the Autumn League pullover and the second one being the Eclair pullover. So the Eclair is actually the inspiration for the overall look and design of the sweater. The Autumn League pullover is the actual pattern I followed because that was closer to um, the gauge that I wanted to knit at. So in my February podcast episode, I went into the origin story of how I came about to choose the Eclair design. Um, but in brief, the Eclair is, well, both sweaters, the Autumn and the Eclair, are top-down raglans. The Eclair, however, is knit an, on an Aran weight gauge, so about 15 stitches per 10 centimeters. The Autumn League pullover is knit at 19 stitches, but my gauge was 21 stitches. Um, I did start swatching for the Eclair pullover, so I hadn't purchased the pattern yet, um, but you can read the gauge information on the sales page. And I started swatching by holding two strands of my Hulsgarn Super Soft with a strand of Drops Kid Silk, and I immediately knew that I wasn't going to like the fabric that I was knitting up, and I also wasn't enjoying knitting with six millimeter needles. So since at that moment, I decided that I wasn't going to be following the Eclair pattern, and if you think, if you just take away those open sides, side slits of the Eclair, it is just a top-down raglan sweater. 
So since I was going to be making, you know, some modifications anyways, I decided to focus on creating the right fabric and then finding the right pattern to follow. So I went with my preferred needle size, which is four millimeters. And I did with a single strand of the super soft with a strand of the drops kid silk. And I mentioned um, that my gauge was 21 stitches and I went through all the math on the calculations that I did um, to determine how to follow the autumn league pattern even though I didn't meet gauge. So I recommend watching that because I'm not going to repeat all of that just for time and not having to repeat myself again. But essentially what happened was that my gauge gets me 90% of the size of the original pattern measurements for the autumn league pullover. I definitely could have done a search on Ravelry based on my actual gauge and find a pattern that way, but I wanted to go with a pattern that I already knew that I liked the finished measurements and the fit of, and um, a top-down raglan is a construction style that I am very comfortable with knitting up and also comfortable with manipulating and adjusting things as necessary for my fit. So based on my math, um, and my calculations on what sort of measurements I wanted to knit up. I still followed it, the exact stitch counts from the Autumn League pullover. Um, I just, I did a combination of a couple of sizes to get uh, something that was going to work for me. And I followed the pattern exactly for the increases and creating the yoke. And, but once the yoke instructions finished, so where the increases stopped for the size I was following, I didn't have a deep enough yoke. And part of that was because my row gauge was quite a bit off, like more off than my stitch gauge was compared to the patterns gauge. And, but that was okay because I was planning on knitting a deeper yoke anyways. So based on an existing sweater, I measured you know, my desired yoke depth length, compare that to what I already had and, you know, translated that length to the number of rows based on my um, gauge watch. And then I also wanted to add some more body increases at that point. So within that, you know, predetermined number of rows, I also figured out how to add those additional increases. And I didn't add them at the same rate throughout. And I'm going to get into a little bit of that. But essentially, I was kind of following um, compound raglan shaping to finish off my sweater. So once I worked the extra rows and increases for my yoke, I cast on the underarm stitches and separated the front and back panels and worked them separately um, flat in rows. Now, I remind you, I did not purchase the Eclair Pullover pattern, but it is a paid pattern and I don't feel comfortable describing in great detail exactly how I did the open slits because I was able to figure out how it's done in the Eclair pattern based on research, looking at different photos, and there is a video linked on the Ravelry sales page on how the designer picked up stitches to work the front panel. So I figured all this out and did it with my gauge, of course. If I can figure it out, you can too. Um, but if you look at how my sweater looks and compare it to the actual Eclair sample, it pretty much looks the same. Okay, now I'll expand a bit more on why I decided to choose the Autumn Lake pullover pattern um, and also why I recommend it. It's not my first time using this pattern. This was actually my third time uh, following this pattern. It is a free and now a size inclusive pattern. So back in October, the designer added more sizes. So it now has eight sizes. Um, another reason why I like this pattern is because I like the fit. So it's not a fitted raglan, but it's not a you know, super oversized one either. It, there's a comfortable amount of ease and 
it's just a really good base pattern for me. There is a little um, traveling stitch detail uh, at the top front or just below where the ribbed collar is. And that is something you can, you know, leave out if you don't like that look. And it won't compromise any sort of like your gauge in that area because the traveling stitches really don't change the gauge. Not like, unlike, you know, if you were to take a full on all over cabled pattern and just knit the same one in stockinette, you would actually end up with a larger sweater in stockinette because um, cabling really pulls in the stitches. Uh, another reason I like this pattern is not because I don't like short rows. So this actually happened to be in the first um, raglan pattern that our sweater that I'd ever created. Um, and it's still, I still find it enjoyable. Like I still go back to it. I still recommend it, mention it to you guys. So if you are at all intimidated by short rows, this does not use short rows. It uses a different method to raise the back of the neck. Um, if you want a nice comfortable fit so that your front is not choking up against your neck, you need to do something to raise the back of the sweater. And the method that's used in this one is actually by starting um, the sweater flat and not casting on all of the front stitches right away. So you'll work back and forth in rows. And while you're doing that, you work your raglan increases, and then you also start adding uh, stitches to the front part. And then there'll come a row where you actually cast on the rest of the front stitches. So if you're worried about rowing out, because that's something that can happen when you're working flat, it would only happen for the first maybe, you know, inch um, of the back which it's not going to be very noticeable and it might even block out a little bit but um this is a really great method it's also i like adding on the collar after um, i don't really prefer knitting the ribbing collar and um, then working in like round um, switching to stockinette uh, i just like having the full kind of sweater made and seeing how that fits and then that helps me determine how long of a collar to actually make um because i've definitely been a little bit burned in the past where you've started in the round with the ribbing right away and i've kind of misjudged how much you know that sweater like in terms of the weight will pull down or not pull down so i like doing the collar after and i just i also just really like picking up stitches and the final reason why i like this sweater is what i something i mentioned was compound raglan shaping or compound raglan increases and i will provide a link to an article that better describes this um, technique or method than i can but i'll try to kind of give you my simplified version of it so if you are familiar with raglan construction, then you know there are four points, two in the front, two in the back, where you work your increases. Now this compound raglan shaping can be done whether you're doing um, bottom up or top down, but I'm going to be describing top down since this is a top down pattern. Now, when you first start working those increases, uh, usually a pattern will say, you know, increase, every other row, for example. And some regular patterns will actually have that same increase rate from the beginning all the way to the point at which you would separate for body and sleeves. And that creates a very nice straight raglan line. However, that doesn't equal a great fitting sweater. Depending on your shape, because remember we are three-dimensional beings, depending on how maybe full busted or not you are, you could end up with extra fabric in this kind of armpit, just above your armpit area. Now, if you've made something that's more of a relaxed fit, then maybe that bit of fabric is okay. But if you're making something that has, you know, less positive ease or um, it could just, not fit you very well. So what compound raglan increases do 
is have a varying rate of increases all the way down. So this sweater um, starts with a relatively quick increase rate of increasing every other row. And then at a certain point it changes and it actually changes in a way that you're not always increasing the sleeve stitches at the same time as the body stitches. So what happens, you've got your initial fast increase and then when the increase slows down, you can imagine the raglan actually curves a little bit downwards towards vertical, not quite actual vertical, but you can imagine on your body, if you've got a quick increase, so it goes out horizontally, and then if you slow that down, then it goes downwards mm -hmm. a bit. And that creates a nice shape around your arm. And what I did on mine was that I also did that at the you know, like near the underarm area when I added those extra increases when I was making that deeper yoke I increased it like quickly again like the beginning so my raglan actually has this s shape that goes like this and I think that has contributed to a really nice fit around my arm even though I have a lot of positive ease in mind and I chose to go with the circumference that was at least um, my hip circumference so even though like if i lift up my arms you can see how boxy and how big my sweater is but my armhole area fits really nicely so definitely check out the article that i've linked if you want to know more about raglan compound raglan shaping hopefully i've described it you know correctly but um I'm not an expert on it, but I do understand like the shaping of it. And it's not wrong to not have it, but if you've had fit issues in the past, like give it a go. Um, there is a pattern actually, a pretty popular pattern that does not use compound raglan shaping, at least for the first five sizes. So the Lento mm -hmm. is a pretty popular top-down raglan, but if you knit sizes one to five, the increase rate for the raglans is the same from the beginning to the end. Um, it has less positive ease than this Autumn League pullover pattern, so maybe it still like keeps close to your body and fits okay, but I just thought I'd throw that out there. All right, so that was kind of like a lot of background, a lot of like the making of the sweater. Hopefully that wasn't too confusing. Um, but I wanted to mention next how much I have worn this sweater since um, I completed it. So I finished the sweater mid-March and I kid you not, I have worn this probably every other day since I finished it. Um, it was still relatively chilly when I finished it. so. It was great, it fits under my jackets, guys. If you've been watching, you know that I've had issues with my sleeves and all the extra bulky fabric fitting in my jackets because I have somewhat fitted jackets. This fits great, even though there is a bunch of fabric in there, the fabric that I've created is kind of thin and light, mm -hmm. so it fits. Sorry, my phone is buzzing. I need to move this away. <laughs> Hopefully it's nothing urgent. It wouldn't be my husband because my husband is here working from home today. Um, yeah, for this a lot. It looks great over top of a button up, which was what I was, you know, the initial kind of inspiration and what appealed to me about the eclair was that the sample was shown over top of a collared button up. And I thought, wow, that is a great way to be able to wear my button ups when it's still kind of chilly. Otherwise my button ups have just been strictly like springtime outfits or if I'm inside and I don't need an extra layer. Um, but I'm enjoying outfits with layers. It kind of just elevates the whole look. So I like that I have an, a sweater that fits properly over my button ups now. The sweater still looks great without a button up as well though. So even though it's big and boxy, the fabric has really great drape and it hangs straight down. So it doesn't look like I'm wearing a ginormous oversized sweater. I also chose a circumference that's, um, it's a little bit larger than my hips. And 
you know, given that there's going to be open sides or side slits, I didn't have to make it that large, but while wearing it, I just didn't want the sides to be kind of splayed open all the time. I just wanted them to have this nice drape to it. And um, yeah, I really like that fit. And I've made the length, it is kind of cropped in the front. The back is definitely long. It's doesn't cover the pockets of my jeans, but it reaches kind of like the top of that. But I intentionally made it the front just long enough that it will look okay on its own without a shirt layered underneath. The sleeves are, have a nice taper to it. There is no puffiness um, when you transition from the stockinette rows to the one by one ribbing for the cuff. I didn't want to have a really tight cuff and a puffy look there. Um, and so I just made sure I didn't decrease too quickly um, when I was transitioning from stockinette to that ribbed cuff. And if you've been following for a while, you know how much I love to roll up my sleeves. I mean, my sleeves are rolled up right now. Funny enough, when I have been wearing this sweater, I haven't been rolling up my sleeves. And I think it's because the fabric is so light that the sleeve kind of like sits up and it doesn't kind of hang at the full length that I knit it to. And it just kind of sits at bracelet length, which is kind of perfect. And because it's so light, it doesn't it fall down when I have my arms straight down. So my sleeves are out of the way when I'm doing things. So maybe that's a sign I should be making more bracelet length, um, nicely tapered sleeves. That is my autumn eclair, my brown sweater. I love it so much. Um, I know for sure that this would pass the performance review. So I don't even know if this would come up when I do the next round of performance reviews for my knitwear. Uh, like, I don't even think this has to go on a probationary period, like you're in. <laughs> so let's get into the whips and yes, whips. I have broken my kind of goal, my rule. I said that I was going to try to only have one whip on the needles at a time, like one for myself and one for my daughter. So max two whips. That is not the case because I get a little crazy um, this month. <laughs> so let's get into the things that you kind of should be aware about based if you've watched my February episode. Okay, so here is my Friday tea, which is the front, which is the back. It's funny, I, when I look at this, I think, wow, this this looks like it could be something for my daughter, but it is broken rib, so it will relax quite a bit when I block it. Sorry, I've got my my stitch holder thingamabobs are sticking sticking out here, but I have separated the body and the sleeve stitches, so I'm now just working away on Body Island. Um. What can I say about this? Oh, happy news. I not experience any sort of um, knitting wrist pain anymore. Yay. So that was a major concern. When I started this top, I was very worried whether I would even be able to continue working on it because my left wrist was hurting. But now that I'm on a larger cable size, I think it's kind of it's gone so i think when i was working the smaller circumference the angle that of working with the 16 inch cable length um, just wasn't favorable for my wrist and but now that i'm on the longer cable and i also switched to a longer needle length as well um it's all comfortable um, I still, of course, experience some fatigue and fatigue sooner than I would on larger needles, but at least I don't have straight up pain. I just, my fingers get a little bit tired from holding these teeny tiny needles, which are a new kind of needle, which I forgot to mention last month, but, um, because I want to try to get into knitting more garments with, uh, fingering weight, I decided to buy a new kind of needle. I saw, is her name Jeanette from New Wave Knitting? 
she was gifted the uh, collage needles and they're a canadian product actually and what's cool about them is well one they spin but the main thing is that they are square in shape so you have a nice flat surface area um, to grip onto and that honestly it does make a difference i didn't know if it was so i only bought um, a couple sizes of these needles not a full set um, the set also is quite pricey but i didn't need a full set of these needles um, the only thing i wish was different about these is that the tips are not super pointy so i did have some trouble some difficulties when i was doing my make one left and make one right increases it just was hard to stab into the right um, part of the loop there it's there's a special like patent um, like a patented technology that they use for how the needle connects and is able to spin so these don't attach by like screwing in they click into place um, but then that also means you need a special tool to separate um, the needle from the cable. Um, you can get ones that are not interchangeable, but I love interchangeable needles. Um, but yeah, I don't know if I can really show it. But there's like this teeny tiny hole. And there's two of those. So I was looking up, so I did quite a bit of research before you know, finally deciding to choose to buy these needles, which they're not expensive when you buy them individually. Like a set of, or a pair of needles, I think is about around $20 Canadian, around there, um, which if it's something that I'm going to use and it, I'm only buying you know, a couple sizes, I'm willing to pay that price because well, it's paid off, my hands don't hurt as much with um, knitting with three millimeter needles. Um, but I did quite a bit of research looking into um, the specialized tool because since I wasn't buying a set, I wasn't going to have a tool come with the needles. And I was skeptical and also kind of cheap about how important that tool was. And you definitely need something to separate the needle and the cable. But based on photos and I, figured out how to make my own tool um, because the tool is expensive it's more than the cost of a pair of needles and a cable um, but I'll show you my my tool that I made it's free it's made out of a paper clip it is a little fiddly to work with but I can do it so that's important um, I don't know if I can recommend this for other people but um, here it is, it's just part of a paper clip that I trimmed. And um, yeah, they're like 90 degree plier kind of things. So this is what I use to separate the needle from the cable. Not too much more to say about the Friday tea. Um, I think, oh, okay. Jogless stripes. I'm not unfamiliar with the method. I've used it before and it's something that's mentioned in the pattern. When I started doing the stripes though, I completely forgot uh, for the first color change, I think. And then when I came to the second stripe, I was like, okay, I better do it. But what's really awkward about doing the jogless stripe method is that when you change colors, it's on an increase round so when you come back around and you lift the stitch up it's like a twisted stitch from your make one left of the previous round and so it looked kind of wonky like it wasn't very clean in my opinion at least the way i was doing it and then i don't know i don't know if it actually made a really big difference and then i just didn't like doing it so i stopped doing jogless stripes altogether on the on the increase rounds on the yoke so i don't think it looks terrible the stitch height is not very high so even if there is a little bit of a jog it's not too noticeable and it's 
one of the back raglans and my hair is almost always down so I don't think anyone's gonna notice I can see where I definitely messed up one of them and it's actually where I did the jogless method there's quite a jog here like this one and I did the jogless stripe method on that one so yeah but it's all but where it happens it's coming in at an angle and it's like on the increase rounds for the raglan so I just stopped doing them but I am doing them on the body because there's no awkward um, loop from the make one that I'm lifting up and uh, it's working out on the body so far so yeah I don't know if anyone else came across that issue but that's what I've done okay the next whip is something like i am excited about the friday tea but i'm very excited about this one because i'm using the noro mandara yarn uh, i have a couple reels showing off this yarn because it is just so cool guys and i cast this cardigan on i think mid-march like after i finished my brown sweater and hold it up for you guys I've already I've started the ribbing for the body. That's how far I've come. And actually, I'll put it on. Hopefully, I don't get too hot because I have to show you guys something about it. So I originally wanted to make the champagne cardigan and didn't purchase the pattern. Kind of did the thing that I did with my brown sweater. I just decided to swatch with needles, my preferred needle size, and see where I you know where my gauge landed uh did not meet gauge for the champagne cardigan um but also my gauge is larger so it's not like um i didn't want to have as much positive ease as a champagne cardigan as well so since my gauge was larger i couldn't just knit a smaller size to end up with a smaller cardigan because i already knit the smallest petite knit um, small size and petite knit patterns so since I was going to have to kind of make things up or modify things I decided to not use the champagne cardigan pattern so I did not purchase it and I'm using a resource that I already have so this is you know another one of my goals for this year was kind of using books or magazines or patterns that I already have and I'm using Ann Bud's um, book, The Knitter's Handy Book of Top Down Sweaters. So I've referenced this uh, to know how many stitches to uh, cast on. Because I always struggle with that because about neck size and things like that. Um, so which page was this on? Oh, I can see where Darcy colored in my book. Um, this book, if you're not familiar with it, it's gives you kind of like the schematics the measurement drawings of the sweaters and then you have to decide yourself um like how much ease you want and then pick the, your size that way i'm looking that's the wrong page oh, child's adult sizes so it will give you um like yarn requirements or estimates for how much yarn you're going to actually need and then across the top i'm not going to give you like a full detailed view of this because this is a book that you can buy you can also buy an ebook version of this as well um, but across the top will be the different circumference sizes so this goes from a finished size of 36 inches or 91 and a half centimeters up to 54 inches or 137 centimeters so not completely size inclusive depending on what kind of sweater you're making if you're making something more fitted with less ease then maybe but i feel like it should go farther um and then the next table will have your gauge so and this is the gauge your stitches per inch so like three it says three stitches per inch or four so and then you follow the kind of the pattern in these columns so i decided that i wanted to have 
less ease in the champagne cardigan and but i also didn't want to have really big armholes i want you know a somewhat closer fitting cardigan so i've combined two sizes for mine so kind of like cast on the smaller size but doing the increases for the body for the larger size while at the same time like stop increasing for the sleeves because i don't want my sleeves to be the size of the larger size it's getting confusing sorry <laughs> This is a book that you can buy, so I don't want to say too much about like the actual pattern. Um, but once I finished the yoke and separated for the body and the sleeves, I kind of like don't need to refer to this book anymore because I got what I needed from here and the rest I can figure out on my own. A feature that I like about the champagne cardigan is the how deep the v-neck is and that is something I definitely wanted to replicate in my version and I wasn't very sure about what increase rate I should do and I'm impulsive because I just jumped into making this cardigan I you know could have taken the time to maybe swatch and see what sort of slope I could create um, but I decided to just wing it. Uh, I started with one kind of increase rate. Here, I'm just going to, I have to get up to show you. Move my hair out of the way. I started with an increase rate that was too quick. And I have a pin here. So you can see if I had kept going with that increase rate. Um... The v-neck is very small and now don't forget that a button band is added after so it'd be like nothing <laughs> no openness whatsoever um now i changed my rate so instead of frogging back and redoing the increase rate i just left it um, because i will let you know in a second how i'm going to fix that so here's where my increases stop and it just worked straight down from here. But after this pin, I worked a slower increase rate. So you can kind of see where the fabric is naturally kind of curling in. Thanks, Stockinette, but actually, thank you, because this actually shows you the kind of shape I actually want to create. So all this extra fabric um, will end up being folded in when I do the button band pick up. I'm just going to make sure I follow the slope that I do like and then when I get up to here I'll just pick up stitches you know towards more of the interior of the sweater and then I'll just have a bit of extra fabric on the inside but that is okay because I'm pretty sure it will it should lay flat enough once it's been blocked so when I get to the button band pick up stitches part I will block uh, my front panels in this area to make sure it lies flat and then just make sure I'm following like the same columns where I'm picking up my stitches because I also don't want to just make a super straight line and this is why I wore this shirt in particular because you can see this v-neck it comes down and it's got a little bit of a curve um, it's not just you know I'll pull it it's not just like a straight line. So I kind of want to mimic that shaping for my cardigan. And my cat's at the door. I gotta go let him in. One sec. So that is where I'm at with this cardigan. Oh, Tiberius just jumped onto the table. Hey buddy. Hi. You come for a visit? Yeah. You had to go the long way in front of the camera to get to your cat tree. Of course you did. Um, yeah, I am really enjoying the yarn. It's really fun to just keep knitting me like, ooh, look at that color. Ooh, look at that. I just jumped off the table. Oh, God. Um, because like the thick, thin nature is really cool and you get some parts where you get a thicker part of the yarn, but also like this pop of color, which is really fun. So it's almost like there's these like nips, sorry, tweety bits almost, um, I'll show you where like my one of my favorite ones because I got some favorite pops in here. Look at that big orange spot right there. The yellow one. 
And so, yeah, so it's fun to see which kind of colors pop up. And speaking of color, look at this. I got these bright pink needles. Tiberius, hey. It's probably is getting, no, it's not his dinner time. Okay. Um, yeah, I got new needles. So these are the Luca Blush Shorties. I bought the set, didn't need it, but my cousin, she was buying herself a set because she lost some of her needles, so she needed new ones. So I was kind of jealous and I don't have any short wooden needles. Um, so I was like, yeah, I'm going to get them because <laughs> she said she really liked working with them. And yeah, anyways, here they are. Aren't they cute? And bonus, um, I didn't realize it until my cousin mentioned to me, but these, um, it's like they do spin, which is great because I can't, uh, use needles that you screw in and then have no spinning function because they always just come apart. Even if I've turned the key, um, I'm just that kind of knitter where I need that spin or I just need a whole different system altogether is why I use um, metal Addy needles as my main set. Uh, those have a little click, such a click technology. All right, guys, I have one more whip to share. So yes, I have three projects on my needles right now, but the next one is something I am really excited to be doing. Um, yeah, test knitting. Before I show you um, a little backstory of my thoughts on test knitting. I highly respect everyone who does it. I, I think it is important to help a designer get out a pattern that is accurate. Um, but I'd always felt hesitant on applying for test knits because I'm the type of person who makes a lot of customizations. Uh, I see patterns as guidelines and then I always make things how I want to make them. So I was, you know, had always been concerned whether I would enjoy a test knit and, you know, the whole process of actually like following the pattern to a T. But then this opportunity came up. Um, Sarah of Noelle Knits posted, um, well, I had seen on her Instagram that she had put out a tester call for her first pattern, which is a children's pattern called the Hannah Cardigan. And she had put in her stories the day before the test um, was supposed to start that she was still looking for test knitters for size um, two to three years. And my daughter is almost two and a half, so she falls in that category. And I looked up the yarn requirements and I had something in my stash that I could use. So it seemed like everything was aligning. So I decided to apply and I got it. And I'm really happy that I did because I am enjoying the process, but it's also because I'm not knitting for myself. So when I knit things for my daughter, I, I always follow the patterns exactly as they say generally, um, because I'm not the one wearing it. So I don't know if it should have a bigger armhole or a longer sleeve. Um, my daughter's not at the point where she can give me feedback um, about her clothing. I feel like it's going to come soon though. She's the personality on this one. Uh, <laughs> no, it's all good. Um, she's very intelligent and entertaining for a two and a half year old. Um, but I really like it. And, you know, there are some things that other test knitters and myself have brought up that, you know, not quite right, but nothing like majorly wrong about the pattern. Everyone is, seems to be going along relatively smoothly. Uh, I love seeing all the other yarn choices. Um, so there is a mix of like DK weight and I'm holding uh, fingering weight yarn double. So there's a, a two options that you have for this pattern. Um, but yeah, the Hannah cardigan is a half fisherman's rib uh, V-neck cardigan for children um, from baby size, I think it's six months to uh 10 years old uh let me pull it out 
So an extra exciting thing about this test knit is that Sarah is also, um, she lives here in Vancouver as well. So a local to me, new designer. So I actually messaged her and said, you know, we could set up a play date, um, chat about the pattern. And I'm also thinking, I didn't mention it, but I should have, um, wouldn't it be so cute to get our children together in the cardigans? Um, she already has finished samples for her two kids already, but you know, add in another photo opportunity, photo shoot for our kids. I think that would be really fun. Probably hectic because photographing children is not easy, but you know, I'm game for it. So Sarah, if you are watching this, um, I'm game for a little kids photo shoot. If you are up for it, I know busy schedules and such might not work out, but I'll leave it out there as an option. So I was able to cast on pretty much right away. I had to make my swatch and then wait for that to dry, but I cast on the day after the test started and I've already joined the body and the fronts. So I'm working back and forth and I just reached the halfway point for the total length I need to work on the body before I get to the ribbing. I've already had Darcy try this on and I don't know why I was like kind of surprised it actually does fit because I've you know I've been looking at this and I'm like does this look big? I'm just not used to how much my daughter has grown <laughs> but it looks like it's fitting her great so far. Um, the experience of knitting Half Fisherman's Rib has been great it's nice um, with working it flat because you get some relief. You get a knit row um, every other row. Um, not that the like stitch pattern row is difficult, but it's nice to just have one really quick row, which also contributes to that, you know, just one more row. It's like, oh, I just want to get to that knit row. And before you know it, it's past midnight, <laughs> which is what happened the first day I was working on it. I just kept going and my husband was like what are you doing still awake and knitting of all things yeah I don't want to say too much about it because it, this isn't testing not that I see that you know the actual design would change very much but um, yeah I will of course say more when it is all done I really like how the back looks where the back and the front panels connect i don't know if i can show you but yeah it looks look at that detail it looks pretty good um i'm using the same yarn as my brown sweater so this is some more host yarn super soft yarn um, i'm hoping it blooms um when i wash it and fills up some of this like openness that I'm getting. I think it's because this super soft is like a light fingering. So, but that's okay if it's a little bit open because it just means it'll be a little bit more breezy, which is actually going to be better for my daughter because she runs quite warm. And this will also mean that this can be worn for spring and possibly summer evenings. So I started this project by caking up two 50 gram uh, balls of yarn. And this is kind of like how much I have left. So really not too much yarn being used at this, you know, for my size. So I'm definitely gonna have um, some more cone yarn left over, but that is okay. I'm already thinking like fingerless gloves would be nice, but we'll get to that in the fall. But yes. Sarah, Noel Knits, Hannah Cardigan, yeah. I am really enjoying my very first test knit. Um, yeah, and I'm pretty sure Sarah's got some other designs or patterns on the go for future, so I think I would apply to be a test knitter for her again. All right, guys, that was a lot to go through. Um, if you are still watching at this point, uh, thank you for hanging out with me uh, as I went through, you know, a lot more whips than I ever intended to have. Um, and I was actually hoping that, you know, with approaching April, my whips would kind of 
you know, slow down because I really want to get back into sewing. I actually started sewing a dress, I think in February or January, and I didn't finish it because I started to uh, really get into whatever was on my needles at the time. So it looks like I might have to push back my sewing projects to May. Um, but we'll see. I also just said yes to my sister for a crochet project. I just keep adding things to my plate. I gotta stop. <laughs> but anyways, um, uh, thanks again for hanging out with me uh, for this podcast episode. I am going to continue releasing podcast episodes monthly and fit other content in between um as much as I enjoy doing these podcasts, I also really enjoy non-podcast format videos like my um, reviewing my knitwear performance review video. That was actually um, quite a lot of enjoyment for me um, to come up with that idea. So I definitely want to, um, you know, go down that road a little bit more and see what else I can come up with for you guys. So thanks again. And until next time, guys, happy knitting. Bye.